Well, welcome back to Rare Elvis Photos. Um, we have been reading some books lately, and I've been really enjoying y'all, uh, all the wonderful comments. And I've been enjoying reading these books because I haven't read, I hadn't read Kathy, Elvis and Kathy before. I had read Marmee Days with Elvis because Johnny sent it to me. And if, hey, if you have not seen this book yet on my page, because maybe YouTube's not pushing it as much, uh, make sure you click on Rare Elvis Photos, the name below the video, when you're done watching this Elvis and Kathy episode. Go to the podcast section and look for My Army Days with Elvis. And uh, and you can read this book along. It's so funny. It's so entertaining. And it's stories about Elvis you have not heard of. So make sure you do that by Johnny Lang. All right, so let's get into Elvis and Kathy. Um, we have been reading about a lot of stuff. We read about their uh, first kiss. Uh, we read about some bomb scares. Uh, we read about uh, the first night she spent alone with Elvis in bed. Um, we've gotten to some great background on who Kathy Westmoreland was. Um, and um, yeah, so let's uh, let's find out where we were. I believe we are on page around fifty-two or fifty-three. Dun, dun, dun. Go. All right, so here's the fight. The fight. They had a fight. Okay. So, this is where we left off. It was page 46. What happened was there was a bomb threat uh, at a concert, and... Uh, and the guys told her not to say anything to Elvis about it because they had just had a gun threat. Somebody's going to shoot Elvis. Uh, actually, let me stop that real quick. So they had just had a, a threat of Elvis's life at the last show. So he got upset and said, you know, he said, uh, how can I ever trust you again if uh, you don't tell me important things like that? Don't ever keep it anything from me again, Kathy. You hear? His voice was still angry. He hadn't liked my weak excuse either. It was not the first time that we came close to an argument, but I never tried to hide that kind of thing from him again. Maybe the bodyguards and the colonel could get away with it, but Elvis had let me know that he expected complete and honest loyalty from me, or else. Then he cooled down and was back to his old self again, but somehow I knew that these threats, they took a great deal out of him. Elvis was a loving person who gave love and affection to the world. He tried to puzzle it out, but he couldn't understand why anybody would want to kill him. And at that point in my life, I must admit I was equally as bewildered. I had always been very sheltered, actually. I didn't know about mental cases, fixations, compulsive behavior patterns. Uh, you know, I didn't then, but as the years went on, I found myself suspicious and wary of crowds in general, and some people in particular, but not Elvis. It seems that no matter how many death threats... And there were many of them over the years. Or how dangerous some of his fans could be. Elvis never lost faith in them. He might temporarily, temporarily fear, uh, feel fear and anger. But he eventually rose above all the ugliness. It was a beautiful thing to watch. But more than a little dangerous too. If the gun threat in Las Vegas and the bomb threat in Phoenix weren't enough chilling experiences for me. I almost got killed in St. Louis which was our next stop after the phoenix performance when we arrived at the hotel in st louis after a long plane ride there were three limos and one acted as a, de a deco limo decoy limo by parking in front of the hotel you know which i thought was very clever get this a little closer there we go uh the idea was to make the fans think elvis and his troop would be coming in the front entrance when in fact we were going to sneak in through the side door I've never understood what kind of communication systems avid fans have about celebrities, but they do have one. I'm convinced of that. Anyways, we get to the side door. The entire area was swarming with fans yelling for Elvis. Elvis, Elvis, Elvis. I could just hear him. Elvis smiled and waved at all of them and said, said to me before we got out of the car, uh, hold on to my coat and we'll just storm on through. Now hold on tight. Here we go. I held on as tight as I could. And all I could see were faces and arms and people trying to block our way to the door. And to my horror, Elvis gave a lunge and I lost my grip on his coat. Suddenly, I was all alone with this mob. As I reached the door, one of the hotel security guards thought it was a zealous fan and had no idea I was with the show. 
Suddenly, I felt this terrible pain. The guard had given me a real karate blow to the neck. I saw stars and was just about ready to faint. She's with us! She's with us! One of the bodyguards was screaming at the guard over the chaos. But it was too late. And by then, they were giving me the rough treatment. I was in pain and having trouble catching my breath. But finally, I was inside the hotel and safe. And there stood Elvis laughing at me. I told you to hang on to my coat, he said. I really wanted to hit him. And all I could think of him saying was, What kind of world uh, do we live in where... What kind of people go around taking a karate chop at some small woman uh, who couldn't be a threat to anyone? They are animals. I'd come from a part of the show business where the fans were well-behaved. Nah, boring. It was boring music. And so fans were well-behaved because it was boring music, Kathy. You know, maybe it was good music, but it was boring. That's not Elvis. All right, people stop. Uh, people might stop me for an autograph or talk about a talented nephew or niece, but in my world, they didn't try to tear your clothes off because it was boring music, Kathy. Boring. Uh, and you didn't have people who were going to shoot you or threaten to blow you up, and certainly you didn't have people hitting you so hard it could have put you in a hospital. Uh, what zany, sick kind of show business was this anyways? Well, it wasn't the people, Kathy. It was, body, it was the security guard. Um, anyways, still, there was much, much more to that kind of violence to come. But I never got used to it. And even to this day, I don't understand it. It's because you played boring music before, Kathy. Um, <laughs> one thing I should mention here is that a woman named Patricia Parker. Hey, Remember those, uh, uh, well, let's just, just read this. Uh, name of Patricia Parker had filed a paternity suit against Elvis, and he knew that they would try to subpoena him as he signed autographs. So he was avoiding signing autographs, and it turned out his hunch was right. That's just how she did it, and Elvis had signed the subpoena acknowledgement, thinking it was just another fan. And with that, Elvis got angry. So back here, Patricia Parker. You probably have seen the, uh, you probably saw the headlines back in the day uh, where they, where she pretended that Elvis was had had uh, got her pregnant, and they were never any, anywhere near each other. So he says, uh, "Let me take the damned lie detector test. Give me the blood test. Let's do it now. Anything to prove it isn't my baby." Well, he took a blood test, a lie detector test, and passed both, proving to the court satisfaction that he was innocent of all charges. We left St. Louis and headed for Detroit. That night, Elvis and I went back in the bedroom of the Fairchild, looking out the large picture window. At the crystal clear midnight sky. Uh, you having a nice time? He asked as we cuddled. Uh huh, I sighed. Uh, Isn't it fun uh, traveling like this? He asked. Well, naturally, it was fun for me. He truly appreciated what he had and enjoyed living in the now at that moment and sharing it with me. It was a simple thing gazing up at the stars and holding hands. Uh, where do you want to go, honey? Uh, just say the word and I'll take us there, he smiled. Well, let's fly to the moon, I answered excitedly, and we flew. Hmm. Now, if I thought the crowds in Phoenix and St. Louis were bad, they couldn't hold a candle to the ones in Detroit. They were wild, rude, and dangerous. And in the audience, I noticed for the first time policemen with helmets on and big billy clubs in their hands. They looked as big as army tanks and just as tough. This should have given me some security, but instead I felt even more baffled and shaken. What a mixed up world when police have to protect a singer from being assaulted by the people who love him. Well, during the show, they kept yelling, get the singers off the stage, because they wanted to get a better and less obstructed view of Elvis. They threw pennies and flash bulbs from their cameras up on stage. This may not sound serious, but believe me, it hurts. And I was worried about my eyes. I was cut on the head uh, on the head by a flash bulb, and pennies kept hitting my body. Move the singers! Move the singers! Now they were chanting in cadence. I wanted to run off the stage, but instead, we were all we, we all stood where we were, and Elvis calmed them down by singing, by singing. I'll face it, Kathy. Yeah, oh, whoops, that's not Elvis talking. That's Kathy. Face it, Kathy. I said to myself, uh, "You are traveling in a world where all the inmates have been let out of the asylum, and they are following you everywhere." As for Elvis, he seemed to thrive on all the excitement he generated. Oh, "Lord have mercy," he would say, and I thought no one would come out and see me. I kept silent. 
There was simply no adequate response to a statement like that. We left Detroit and headed for Miami, Tampa, and then Mobile, Alabama. This part of the trip brought home to me the precarious position I had accepted when I became part of Elvis's life. Elvis had many relatives in the South, and wherever he played in southern cities, many of them came to see the show. That meant no more visits to Elvis's suite as long as they were there, and our meetings were pretty much limited to backstage. But there he was so keyed up and involved, and I was so concentrating so hard on the show that we seldom saw one another, let alone even talked. I had never felt so much despair and been so depressed. I felt as if though I had been deserted and cast aside. I had given Elvis my heart, and now he had no time for me. I also realized the role I played in his life. I was the other woman, but if I had been just a casual friend, we would have been able to be seen in public. It seemed so mixed up, so topsy-turvy, so unfair. I felt ill most of the time, and I couldn't eat, and I learned for the first time in my life that one can nearly perish if they have a broken heart. I had fallen in love for the first time ever, even though I understood about his family visiting and being married, that was the only that was only an intellectual exercise. Emotionally, I didn't understand it all. I couldn't wait until the tour was over and I could go home. I was so hurt that I wasn't even sure I wanted to see Elvis Presley again as long as I lived. So we're talking about going from Detroit to Miami, Tampa, and then Mobile, Alabama. So I'm guessing the shows in Mobile were the ones that were the worst because that's real close to Memphis. Uh, Miami and Tampa, I don't many. I don't know many of his family members that were down there. Um, but still, yeah, it had to be rough. I mean, I think everybody on on this page, on this site, YouTube, on Rare Ever's Photos, has been in love and loved somebody more maybe than you know than they were loved back. Uh, for whatever reason. Um, and Elvis, gosh, we, we know Elvis belonged to the world. He belonged to his fans. He belonged to the music. And that's going to be hard for anybody. And I'm sure that was hard for Priscilla. Whether she loved him or not, you know, it's still going to be tough on her ego. Just like it was tough on Kathy's ego and on her heart. Talks about nearly dying from a broken heart. And we're just in the beginning of the story here. This has got to be 70, 71 maybe. Um... So, chapter three, love possesses not, nor would it be possessed, for love is sufficient unto love, Gibran. But when the tour ended in Mobile, Elvis was going to L.A., and Tom Diskin told me uh, those of us going to L.A. would return on Elvis's plane. Well, Elvis was in a good mood on the flight back home, but I wondered to myself, why was he going to California instead of going back to Graceland? Were Priscilla and his daughter Lisa there, too? Of course, I didn't ask. Maybe I didn't want to hear the answer. The plane was roomy and comfortable. We could eat any time we were hungry, relax, listen to music, and sing. No matter where you were with Elvis, you could count on the fact that we would be singing because he sang much of the time. He sang alone with somebody, sang while playing his guitar, sang while he played the piano, sang in the limo, in the bathroom, and in the bed. He just loved to sing. Well, I love to sing too, but not all the time. Kathy, because you sang boring music back in the day. Uh, okay, that's probably the last time I'll use that line because maybe it stopped being funny five times ago. Um, okay, so um, after a show, when we were all dragging and completely exhausted, Elvis most likely wanted to sing. He never ran out of energy, and sometimes I would join in, but most of the times after a tiring show, I just didn't feel like hearing it, so I would quietly, quietly disappear. If I closed my eyes, I could still see him during one of those carefree times. He would sit down at the piano and began playing and singing, then nod his head to motion for us to join him. During those times, he always looked so happy as if saying, This, my friends, is what it's all about. In spite of the great trip and the fun we were all having on the plane, I was looking forward to being home again, seeing my animals, my friends, my family, and I wondered if anyone would notice that I had changed, that I wasn't the same person who left only three weeks ago, and I wondered about myself. My well-organized, carefully planned life seemed to be in shambles now. When I was back on familiar ground, away from the insanity of these shows and the hectic pace of a tour, would I be able to look at things differently? 
might I not have been carried away by the excitement of it all? Thousands of women over the country, maybe even millions, would give anything to be right here where I was now, sitting next to Elvis Presley, having Elvis touch them, kiss them, and listen to what they had to say. Well, ladies, this is your chance to leave a comment right now. <laughs> I'm sure that the majority of you would agree with Kathy. Um, he was sweet, charming, considerate most of the time, or at least when he was with me. He was fun-loving, unpredictable, daring, and full of life. What more could I want? Not this, my, answer, my heart answered back. I need more. I need more security, more balance in a relationship. But I knew I loved him deeply. It was just a fact of life. I have such a vivid memory of our goodbye in Los Angeles. The plane landed about a half a mile from the terminal, and we stood alone on the windy tarmac, both reluctant to part. Then a blue Mercedes limo pulled up and Elvis got in. It was an emotional moment for me, and I knew I couldn't have walked that distance to the terminal, but I truly have no memory of how I got there. Somebody had to be waiting for me near the plane, but I only see in my memory the two of us standing alone as if we were the only people left on earth trying to delay our goodbyes. But home once again, I quickly got caught up in the whirlwind of the music scene in Los Angeles. I had several Tim Conway TV shows to do at CBS, some shows with Bobby Darren at NBC, and a few studio dates. But even with this hectic schedule, I couldn't keep Elvis off my mind. I would curl up on my sofa after a long, hectic day and think about him, about us. Where is he now? I heard he was still in Los Angeles. Is Priscilla with him? Why doesn't he call? Will I ever hear from him again? I don't want to hear from him again. Uh, oh, yes, I do. Why doesn't he call? Has he forgotten me? Now, now that we aren't on tour together, has he found somebody else like a real glamour girl? He knows everybody in Hollywood, stars and starlets. Why would he be thinking of me? Why doesn't he call? He won't call. I can't believe that he won't call. So these desperate thoughts kept rolling and rolling and rolling over in my mind. I appeared cool, professional, and in control to all my friends and business associates, but inside I was a total disaster. I wanted to talk about him, and yet I couldn't talk about him. How could I explain the way I felt? How it all happened? Words just couldn't express my feelings. Like, why didn't he call? And then, when I least expected it, the phone rang. It wasn't Elvis, but it was his bodyguard, Sonny West. Kathy, Elvis is in Palm Springs. He wants to send a plane after you. Can you come down here for a few days? This was no time to be coy. Love to. <laughs> Great. What time? I'll meet you at the airport and drive you to the house tomorrow. Oh, uh, no, not tomorrow. Tonight, as soon as possible. How long will it take you to get to the airport, Sonny said. Tonight? Now? Well, what's the nearest airport to your house? Well, Ontario Airport. I've flown out of Ontario Airport many, many times and flown in there. I know that airport by heart. Uh, that's me. That's me saying that. Okay, so Ontario Airport, I replied, not believing that after all this time waiting, I would have to leave on a moment's notice. Well, great. Now, write down these instructions. When you get to the airport, the pilot, Milo High, what a name for a pilot, will be looking for you near the terminal where the private planes come in. I hung up and let out a big Texas Yahoo and started getting ready. I wanted to do something with my hair. What would I wear? No time to buy anything new. Maybe I could pick up something in Palm Springs. I thought of the animals, had to make certain that they were taken care of. I should call my answering service and tell them I would be out of town. There was so much to do, but all I really wanted to do was sit in a quiet place and think of all the things I would say to Elvis when I saw him again. Uh, things that had been piling up inside me that I couldn't say to anyone else. Palm Springs is a place for relaxation. Of course, fall and winter are the best seasons to visit. The wide variety of shops, restaurants, and nightclubs cater to every whim of the tourist, most of which are affluent and used to having the only best of everything. Thousands of stories have been written about Palm Springs, but nothing on paper can capture the feeling of complete peace and freedom one finds in this desert oasis. Now, I can I can agree with Kat. Now, I'm from the desert of California, and I'm not from Palm Springs, but I lived in Palm Springs. I lived in 29 Palms, and I used to sing in Palm Springs at the Cactus Corral. Uh, had lots of friends and, uh, you know, romance out there in the desert. Uh, to be, and I grew up out there. Beautiful place, wide open. You can see millions of stars in the sky at night. Millions. You can see for 50 miles, 100 miles in one direction. Uh, when it rains, you can smell it an hour before it gets to you. 
Uh, so I can see why Elvis loved the desert, loved going out there, and why she said, you know, <clears throat> complete peace and freedom. Uh, celebrities are everywhere, from politicians to writers to superstars like Elvis. It's one of the few places in the world where a famous personality can walk into a restaurant, a shop, or even take a stroll without causing a stir. Residents and tourists here are just used to seeing faces that are familiar to millions, and they usually leave them alone. People in Palm Springs seem too sophisticated to fawn over anyone, no matter who they are. This includes U.S. presidents, and uh, many have been known to spend a lot of time there. Well, I didn't know what to expect when I arrived at Elvis's house. But when I saw it, I was pleased. It was a low, one-story, white stucco, Spanish-style home set on a slight incline. But the house sat low to the ground and had a black wrought iron fence, a red tiled roof, and was beautifully landscaped. Charlie Hodge told me Elvis had purchased it, purchased it from the owners of McDonald's hamburger chain. Elvis was on a telephone, and it didn't take eavesdropping to figure out that he was talking to Priscilla, and he sounded angry. I got the impression that she wanted him to come home to L.A., and he was making excuses as to why he couldn't return home right away. When he had hung up, he came over, hugged me, and kissed me right before, and then he proclaimed, Marriage is an outdated institution. Uh, it just doesn't work for most people. It ought to be abolished. Then his mood changed, and like an eager little boy, he took my hand and showed me around. Next to his bedroom was a private little patio with a water fountain, and the water was spurting out at an extremely fast rate. I told Elvis the fountain had high energy, just like him, and he laughed. I didn't mention that the fountain looked as nervous as I felt. When we were on the road, doing the show, everyone would be wrung dry with uh, fatigue, but Elvis kept going. He was always a bundle of energy and full of ideas. Now that, now that he was resting between road tours, his vitality was astounding. He went from one activity to the next with complete enthusiasm. Elvis had purchased some dune buggies, and of course he bought enough for the bodyguards and for friends. Elvis could never seem to buy enough of anything, let alone one of anything. One of the first things on our agenda that day was to pile into the dune buggies and drive into town. Well, it was hilarious, bouncing around in that crazy black dune buggy, racing around with the others right behind us. It was like we were teenagers again. We swam and lay around the pool and even went shopping. I had never been shopping with Elvis before because in any other town in America, we would have had been mobbed or worse. Of course, we ended up in a jewelry store because jewelry, especially gold, was Elvis's favorite item to buy. At one time on the tour, we even had a jewelry store owner from Memphis traveling with us, and he always carried a case full of precious stones and gold items. Later, I will go that uh, go into that with, with greater detail. Um, in Palm Springs, Elvis just shopped and looked and asked questions. I know he made several purchases, and he bought me a beautiful, intricate silver cross. I was thrilled, although I truly didn't like for Elvis to buy me gifts, which is also another story that I'll go into later. Darkness comes early in the desert, and the nights are pleasant and balmy, sometimes a bit cool, but this first afternoon had been perfect. I swam in the pool while Elvis sunned, and then we sat out on the terrace alone and talked. One thing, the house was big enough for us to find privacy, which was certainly a treat. We were both innervated from the sun, the desert air, and all the activity and exercise. Later, in bed, Elvis caressed me tenderly, kissed me, and held me close. I was still apprehensive, and he gently held me and stroked my hair, whispering that he would take care of his Minnie Mouse, which was a new name he had given me and one I still cherish. Minnie Mouse was a Walt Disney cartoon character and was, of course, tiny with a high voice. I was sensitive about my lack of height, which he teased me about constantly, but the name Minnie Mouse stuck, and coming from Elvis, it took on a tender and loving meaning. We slept late, as usual and then went into the dining room for our usual breakfast. The guards and Charlie were there. Uh, Elvis was cheerful and full of jokes, but then he said, uh, Hey boys, uh, you know what? Our Kathy is still a virgin. I could have died on the spot. I know I turned several different colors, and I was angry. Did that mean he'd been discussing my virginity with all these men? What did, I, what did he said? What business was it of theirs? All of these thoughts kept running through my mind, but Elvis seemed oblivious to my anger and embarrassment. How could somebody so sensitive and caring be such a clod? Uh, before I made a scene in front of everybody, I left the table and stormed into the bedroom, undecided as to what to do next. Maybe I should just leave 
catch a bus, a plane, even walk back to L.A. These are the kind of thoughts I was having when Elvis walked into the room. What's the matter, sweetheart? You! Telling everybody I'm a virgin. That's my business, not theirs, and you had no right to discuss it. Well, he looked at me with those eyes that always made me want to melt, and I thought I saw the beginning of a smile on his face, but when he took a good look at me, he decided that might be fatal. So he pulled me to him and held me close. Uh, honey, I, I wasn't trying to shame you. I'm proud of you being a virgin. Uh, not many girls uh, could hold out so long, and I admire the way you want to have sex with somebody you really love and feel passion for. Uh, please understand, uh, I wouldn't hurt your feelings for the world. Of course, I quickly forgave him. I knew in my heart that Elvis would never hurt or harm me intentionally, and I wanted so much to believe that he was proud of me. I think this small tiff made me feel even closer to him, and I felt I understood him even better than ever before. He just said things occasionally without thinking. Uh, you know, the next day we sunned early, rode in the dune buggies, and came back for a swim in the pool before dinner. Elvis and I were relaxing side by side, and he looked up into the sky and said, See that cloud up there? Uh, it looks like the head of a poodle. Well, I looked up, and there it was, a fleecy white cloud shaped like a poodle's head against a soft blue sky. It does look like a poodle. Uh, want me to make it disappear? <laughs> sure, I said, thinking it was some kind of joke. Well, Elvis closed his eyes and remained silent and silent for a short time, and he looked up at the cloud and it disappeared before my eyes. The poodle's head was no longer there. It was gone. How do you how do you do that? I can't believe it. And I couldn't. It was too mysterious for me to even imagine. Uh, well, it's just a form of meditation, he explained. It's very simple. Well, it doesn't sound simple. Uh, yogis can do it, and certain groups of monks practice it. Uh, Indians know how to control the weather. Uh, they sometimes did it with their rain dances. You know Christ taught us with that with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can move mountains. This would be one of many times I would see that Elvis had extraordinary powers. The disappearance of that poodle-shaped cloud truly impressed me, and I've never forgotten the incident. There's no end to the things this man knows or can do, I thought. Uh, and as the years went on, I saw other signs of his ability to meditate and use the power of prayer. Elvis had been ill and seemed to be having some health problems. He suffered from hypertension which in his case was not a nervous disorder, but rather a life-threatening cl clinical disease. Uh, in addition, he had inherited a weak heart, an unfortunate family trait. His blood pressure was very high, and everyone was concerned about the possibility of a heart attack. Later, when we were in bed, I was deeply concerned about his health and asked him about it. He pulled out a PDR, which is a Physician's Desk Reference Manual, sat down on the bed and began reading aloud about some of the new medication his physician had recently prescribed for his problems. Kathy, I've got a cancer-like condition on top of this uh, other heart thing. I was stunned and I couldn't hold back my tears. He tried to reassure me. Uh, don't worry, honey. Uh, Dr. Nick knows what's in my system. He's taking care of everything. He wanted me to know the truth and yet didn't want to make a big issue out of it. He was very gallant, but deep in his eyes, I could see that he was wrestling with a bigger problem. Uh, how much longer do I have? We both felt silent, pondering the seriousness of our conversation for what seemed to be a long time. We were still sitting in bed. Elvis's arm was around me, and suddenly, the other hand was holding the book he had read aloud. I suddenly looked down, and he said, You have the most beautiful feet I have ever seen. His remark surprised me, and I was a little relieved that the subject had changed abruptly. Do you think so? Well, I've always loved my feet, and I really try to make uh, take good care of them. I love beautiful feet, he said, and I think yours are just gorgeous. Well, feet are important to me, too, I told him, and yours are just as perfect as you are. Elvis moved his feet closer and said, I have twin toes, you see. The second and third toes are the same length. They're identical. Lots of twins have this feature. Then Elvis laughed. I remember a girl once, and uh, we were getting along really well. We were on the bed, and uh, she took off her shoes and stockings, and her feet were just plain ugly. <laughs> it turned me off so much, I just got up and left. I, I'll bet she never knew what happened to me, he said with another fit of laughter. You didn't. That's terrible. I usually didn't like for Elvis to tell me stories of other women. I guess no woman does. No woman does. But this was so funny, and he enjoyed telling it. 
so much that I had to join in the laughter too. Besides, I was really in a great mood now that he told me that I had beautiful feet. Elvis put the book down and he kissed me. As usual, his kisses aroused me, but this time I didn't try to pull away. I kissed him back and held on to him, and then, as I ran my hands over his shoulders, his skin, so unbelievably smooth, there was a sense of urgency within myself I had never known before. We're going to end right there. I'm not quite sure where it's going. It might be going there. It might not be. That's going to be, uh, you know, the next section of the Elvis and Kathy. Um, page 61. we got to remember that. So another 15 pages I read there. I think that's about what I'm doing each time is about 15 pages. Um, let's look at some pictures. And know that I will not leave you hanging for too terribly long. I will do another section of this book very soon. Um, because I want to know. I want to know what happens there. You know, I don't like stopping the read, but there's, I have so many things to do that, um, and I've got three books I'm going through here and a few other things. Huh. So, well, in this picture, Ginger Alden, Joe Smith, which is a wife of Elvis's cousin, Billy Smith, and me backstage. She didn't look terribly happy in that picture. Elvis and me in Cincinnati during the last concert tour in 1977 after introducing Vernon, Vernon Presley, who waves to the audience. So that's an important thing as we continue the story. What we're reading right now has got to be 1971. It's not 72, it's definitely 71. It's not, it's not 1970. And there they are in 77. Elvis holding her hand, still taking care of her. You know, making sure that she's with him on tour. Still introducing uh, her as a sweet, high-voiced girl, Kathy Westmoreland. You know, so I don't know exactly where the story's going to go. You know, how long they had this romance. Whether it was all the way through to 1977. Whether it ended earlier. And, and I think that's why you're reading the story with me as well. Um, but, you know, I, I, um, I'm i curious. And I think it's a pretty story. And I, and I think it's a real story. Um, and Charlie Hodge, you know, Charlie Hodge attested all this as well. And Charlie was, some of y'all think he was Elvis's best friend. I think he was certainly one of his best friends. Um, and we know, you know, Elvis loved his cousin. And his you know cousin was family. And a lot of you think that Billy was uh, was Elvis's best friend. Um, and it could be too. And some of you think that Jerry Schilling is his best friend. And some of you don't think it. You think that Jerry's betrayed Elvis. But when, we, when we're talking about Kathy here, um, it's very important to communicate that Kathy and Charlie were very close until the end of Charlie's life. And that says something. You know, that says that there is um, there's a seriousness about this book and a, and a reality that you know, Kathy had love for Elvis. It was a real love. And I believe Elvis had real love for Kathy, too. But he had, he had a complicated life. He had real love for a lot of people. I think that most of us can agree on that. Um, anyways, TCB TLC, thanks for reading the book series with me, Elvis and Kathy. Um, we're going to be heading down, probably actually heading down to the beach while you're watching this video. Because this is going up tomorrow. And uh, we're, uh, we're heading down to Destin, Florida for a week or so. And I want to just say, say, hey, Connie, you're going over to Graceland for your birthday, I, I believe on the 5th or the 7th. I can't remember which day. Enjoy yourself. And I know you said you're going to be playing all the Elvis songs that I've got on my channel. Um, you know, you don't have to do that. Listen to Elvis songs while you're there. Enjoy the museum. Uh, enjoy the, the Peace and Serenity by Elvis's gravesite, the emotional response it's going to bring. And uh, let us know. You know, let us know how your trip went. And um, hope you have a wonderful birthday week. And for those of y'all going to Graceland soon, I want to hear about it. Um, all right, till next time, this is Rare Photos. I really enjoyed spending some time with you.